So in this video, we're going to talk about multivariate optimization. Uh, reminding ourselves here what we're talking about. So we're seeking to find um, the variables x and y that maximizes or minimizes some function f of x and y. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at the particular kind of optimization, which is called unconstrained minimization or maximization. Um, and the whole business of unconstrained means that there is no constraints on the values of x or y. For example, x can be taken to be any value. Constraint optimization problems would be where, for example, you would have x, um, just as a, an example, x can only be positive, right? So that's a constrained optimization. Here we're talking about unconstrained. There are no constraints, no requirements on the var or what ranges the variables that you're seeking should be. And the other uh, uh, criterion here is that, you know, f of x, y is just a real number, a scalar number, right? So, for example, if we're talking about uh, the maximization of a function, here is a, 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 a surface rendering of some function. The maximum value is plotted here on top. Right, so we can view this this whole information here as a three-dimensional surface plot. X and Y are again the parameters that you're seeking, and f of x y is the value of the function at x y. Uh, we can plot it this way in three dimensions as a surface rendering, or we can plot it in two dimensions, and we can just plot each line here is the isocontour, meaning the 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 value of f of x along all of these lines here is the same. So we had already a discussion about this, uh, but just as a reminder, here we have uh, the definitions of local maxima versus global maximum. For example, this value here, right, the x value corresponding to the x y value corresponding to that value here, this is called a global minimum. This one particular here is a global maximum. And again, the idea behind global minimum and global maximum are the following. A function, uh, a location in a function is a, called a global minimum if there is no other value of the function that is smaller than that. Conversely, it's a global maximum if there is no other value of the function that is larger than that. Here we have a few local maxima, right? So this is a local maximum. Here's another local maximum. Here you can't quite see it because uh, the function, the rest of the plot is obscuring it. But over here you have another one that is called a local minimum just as to establish nomenclature so here's the general idea we already talked about this but let's put some math into the details here now we're going to start at some position x naught and here x is in bold face so this is indicating that this is a vector and in this case you know we have over here the x coordinate and the y coordinate so this x naught will be a vector containing the little s x naught coordinate, the little y naught coordinate, right? So we speak of the both coordinates as a vector, x naught. So that will be some initial points, so or initial guess. And then we compute a direction, which we call d naught. And if it's if we're talking about a minimization problem, we compute a descent direction. If we compute, uh, if we're talking about a maximization pr problem, we compute an ascent direction. We'll talk about different ways to compute this direction. But then the next step is, step two is, we update our initial guess by taking a small step, the size of the step as measured by the value of the, the, the magnitude of the step h, along that direction, right? And uh, this, uh, this direction, again, can be a maximization direction, which in this case, d naught will be an ascent direction. And conversely, a descent direction if it's a minimization problem. And we repeat the step one and two, right? So we'll have um, x2 here 
which will, again will be a vector will be x1 plus some other h times d1 right so a new direction and so on so here is what we have uh, a demonstration of this this idea so here is iteration one let's say this is d0 here this is our vector d0 so we moved in in this direction for a little while we got to this value of the function and then we computed a new d1 right so we had, we went from here to here then we went from here to here here to here here to here and hopefully we progress and at some point right after perhaps many iterations we get to the value of the function which in this case could be a minimum or maximum we don't know we're just plotting the contours it's just a, a cartoon so here is some 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 more concrete examples so for example let's take a look at this particular function f of xy which is again a quadratic function right and for quadratic functions we already know we can minimize in closed form all we have to do is compute the gradient of this quadratic function and set the gradient to zero this will give us a linear system of equations and we are in business but let's pretend we didn't know this and we just follow through with the definition so we first compute the set of partial derivatives here um, right so the partial derivatives um, is df dx df dy and we if we store this partial derivatives in a vector this is called the gradient right so this is called um, gradient and as you remember from calculus the gradient of a function points in the direction of greatest increase of the function right so let's say for example that our starting point let's say was x equals 1 and y equals minus 1 so x equals 1 is here and y is minus 1 is over here right so this is our x let's say our x naught point let's compute the gradient of this function if we plug in 1 and minus 1 for these equations here where we derived f of x with respect to x and y here's the gradient and plug it in we have that this is a minus 7 and 7 right so this this is telling us that um, this this vector is pointing so it you go minus 7 in the x direction and 7 in the y direction right so this is something along the lines of I'm probably going to miss draw here but this is this is the gradient of the function at that point and as you can see this is the plot of the function over here right so this is a quadratic uh, pointing up so in this case the gradient is pointing the greatest the direction of greatest increase right so this is where more or less where we are and it's pointing in that direction so in a maximization problem it makes sense then perhaps to choose the gradient of the function um, let me restart this uh, so once again we are we're over here right that's our point um, and the gradient is is something like in this direction right so this is the gradient of f here and once again we are uh, we're more or less here so this is the direction of greatest increase so it makes sense that we set the direction the first direction where we're going to go as the gradient of the function this is for a maximization problem and again if we were talking about the minimization problem we would have set instead d to be minus the gradient of the function for a minimization Here we're talking about the maximization because we're talking about this particular function, but in general it can be either one. And this is the whole idea behind the, the steepest descent or steepest ascent. Sometimes it's also called the greatest, uh, the, so the gradient descent or gradient ascent. So let's write this gradient. You see these two names in the literature. And the basic idea is to just do exactly that what we just talked about. We start at some initial guess, x naught. Again, this is a vector, right? If it's 
a function of two variables, this has x, y. If it's a function of three variables, it has x, y, z. It can be a function of 50 variables. Who knows? So, and then step one is we compute the gradient, an ascent direction, right? Or descent, depending on what problem we have. And we update this new guess by taking some step along that direction. And once again, we take the gradient the gradient itself, if we're talking about an ascent problem, meaning a maximization, or we take the negative of the gradient, which is conversely the direction of greatest decrease of a function, and that's we take that if we're talking about minimizing a function. The next natural question to ask is how do we choose this parameter h? How do we choose the step size? And there are two there are two um, ways to do it. Um, one is, is, is more theoretically sound than the other one, so let's co cover this one first. We can do this by line minimization, uh, 1D minimization, for example, if we're talking about the minimization problem. My, this would be called line maximization if we're talking about the maximization problem. What does this mean? This means that we'll find H such that the value of F at uh, this next step here, or x0 plus hd0, now as a function of h, right, forget now, pretend we, we don't care about the, vari the variable x0 itself, we care about what's the value of h. So we, find, we formulate a new minimization problem where we say f of x0 plus hd0, x0 and d0 here are given, d0 could be our greatest our, our gradient, uh, for example, in a maximization problem, right? X naught is already given as the initial guess. So we solve a minimization, but now we minimize with respect to H, right? And we call this X star here to be the value of H that minimizes this function. This is the notation, argument of the minimizer uh, of this function with respect to H, right? How, how do we do this? Well, we just call this, reassign this, uh, this function called this g of h now, which is this function f of x0 plus hd0. But now let's view this as a function of h, h because we already know the values of x0 and d0. These are given. x0 is again is our initial guess, and d0 is the gradient at the initial guess, for example. So now this g is a function of h, and we just covered how to minimize a function of one dimension. So this is sometimes called line minimization or maximization, depending what you're talking about, a minimization problem or maximization problem. And this is the theoretically sound way to do it. The gradient descent algorithm, in theory, would include two steps. One, estimate the gradient or the direction of descent or ascent. And then you do a line minimization to find what is the optimal step along this particular direction to take. Right? A more pragmatic way which is sometimes often done in practice is, well, this, this minimization step can sometimes be computationally expensive. So why would we just choose H to be a small number? And then we repeat this procedure by taking many, many small step sizes. Uh, in practice, you'll see these two strategies being used. Here's an example. Let's develop, or what do we mean develop? Let's write down, right? That's a better English name. a one-dimensional function allowed the gradient direction. So let's imagine, again, this is our, our function. I just chose a quad random quadratic function here. And we start again at minus one, one. This is our initial guess. Here's the gradient evaluated at the initial guess. So minus six, minus uh, six, right? You can write this in, in as sums of, of the canonical vectors i and j. And now we we do exactly as, as we said. We take f of x naught plus df dx times h, right? So this is the, the the coordinate notation as opposed to vector notation. And so we plug this in, right? So now every time we see an x in here, we plug in x0 plus df dx times h. So this is a function of h. This df dx evaluated at that location is already done. We, we computed that here. So we plug that in for x. For y, we plug in this guy which is also already known. So now you can see this is a function of h. And if you multiply this out and, and group the terms, in this case, this function will also be a quadratic function of this one-dimensional parameter h because this function is a quadratic itself.
So now on to a, the next concept, um, which is uh, necessary for this. And this is the concept of a Hessian matrix, which you might have also learned about in multivariate calculus. But let's just review um, the concept behind this Hessian matrix. The matrix in this, in, in this example, we're talking about f being a two-dimensional function, a function of two input parameters, x and y. Right, so the Hessian matrix will be a two by two matrix of second derivatives. Why two by two? Because there are, there are four uh, sets of second derivatives that you can take. You can take the double derivative with respect to x1, right? We used x and y in the previous slide. Here we use x1 and x2 to replace x. One is x and x2 is y, but the, the meaning is the same. So you can take the double derivative with respect to the first coordinate and the double derivative double derivative with respect to the second coordinate, but also you can compute the partial derivative, uh, the, the double derivative with respect to the first partial and then the second partial, and they can take the double derivative with respect to the second partial and the first partial. And in fact, so some of you might remember for calculus, this, this one, this term here, should be equal to this one as long as f is continuous enough. So there is this concept of a Hessian matrix, and again, you can evaluate this Hessian matrix at any input coordinates x1, x2, right? So you can evaluate this at any input coordinates x1, x2, x1, x2, x1, x2. And just like you can test for the second derivative of a one-dimensional function to see, to find out whether you're at a maximum value or at a minimum value, you can, there's also a, a second derivative test for multivariate um, uh, concepts and that is th this this test so for example if you have h evaluated again at some input coordinate you can test if you can find another vector h so that you multiply from the left and multiply h from the right and no matter what x you choose this results always in positive then we call this h to be positive definite at that location again and this means the quadrat the, the the function is like it's like a quadratic pointing up there. So you're talking about a local minimum existing at that point. If you can, for every a a x that you pick, there's this, the converse is true, that this, this result is always negative, then this is, uh, h is negative definite, and you're talking about, uh, talking about a local m maximum at that point. The, the parabola, let's say, is pointing down. But this is not always the case. Sometimes there are mixed cases. Here is, for example, a, a location where, you know, there's, depending on the different x you choose, you can get that this value is positive or negative, both at the same location, right? So you, there, there's some ambi ambiguity to it, um, ambigu ambiguous situations in, in some of the setups. So this, this test is not always conclusive in multiple dimensions. So here is an, an example. Let's compute this uh, this uh, this set of this this Hessian matrix for this particular function here. So right. So we're going to need a few partial derivatives. So let's start by doing df of x y with respect to dx, right? And if you do this, this is going to be minus three x squared plus y plus um, y squared, right? And if we differentiate once again with respect to uh, d squared to x again, right? We're going to end up with minus six x. And now the other one is the mixed one, right? Df dx dy, again, evaluated x, y. Uh, this will be one plus 2y. Right, so this is the, the ones involving x first, so let's do the ones involving y. So here we have df dy, and that's going to be minus 3y squared plus x plus 2y um, plus 2xy. And let's do df Square the, the second partial derivative with respect to, act, to y and evaluate that xy again. This is going to be minus 6y 
plus 2 plus 2x right and let's do this again just to drive the point home that if I take the second now dy with respect to dx I'm going to get 1 plus 2y and it, indeed in this case right because this function is smooth enough I have that this guy here is equal to this guy and again the Hessian matrix then you just put these terms together and you're going to have the f squared the x squared right and so you're going to have d squared f the x dy and here d squared f dy dx and here you have d squared f dy right so you just grab each term here put it in here oops sorry uh, this term here right put it in here grab this term here put it in here and so on so that's the meaning of a hessian matrix so let's look at uh, deriving the newton newton minimization algorithm for a multivariate function we already did this for a univariate function and the whole idea there was we started by using taylor series but we knew taylor, taylor series for a one-dimensional function let's develop the taylor series for a multi-dimensional let's write down the taylor series for a multi-dimensional function and so we have f of x and again uh, x here is a multivariate thing could be you know a three-dimensional vector four-dimensional vector ten-dimensional vector take this function f takes as input that vector and outputs a number right so that's the whole setup here and we evaluate this function at some displacement h from x right and again x and h now are vectors so the multivariate Taylor series that this is going to be can be approximated or, or written down so long as f has enough derivatives as f of x plus h transpose now the gradient times the gradient of f at evaluated at x plus the quadratic term which in multiple dimensions here can be written as h transposed i'll call this hessian matrix which again with respect to this function f evaluated at x times h plus other terms right so this is the the equivalent expansion for the multivariate version of taylor series we're not going to derive this we're going to start uh, from this principle and just what like we did for deriving the the one-dimensional newton's method for minimization we're going to do the same thing here that is we're going to take only the zeroth order term the second order term uh, the first order term and the second order term and we're going to neglect whatever other terms come after this right and we're going to call this function that only this part here now we're going to write this as a function of h instead not x right so let me write this down i'll write this function g of h again h is a vector this will be f of x which is also a vector plus h transposed times the gradient of f of x plus one half h transposed h Right? So this is our function, and if we imagine now that these other terms here are small enough to be neglected, this here, if you notice as a function of h, it's a quadratic function. It matches the exact definition from a few videos back where we talked about a multivariate quadratic function. Right? This, ma this Hessian matrix takes the place of, I think we called A matrix uh, before. Right? So this is, I'll write this again, this is a quadratic function. And we already derived this, so we're just going to use this the result here, that if we'll evaluate the gradient of G now, again, evaluated at H, this will be, from what we did before, just the gradient of F at X, right? So we're going to imagine that X here will be our first guess later on, so X is known, plus this Hessian matrix, 
evaluated at x times h. And we, if we follow the same procedure for minimizing the quadratic function that we had before, we set this to 0. And then we solve for h. So this is now a linear system of equations, right? You can see this is a matrix times a vector of unknowns. h is now an unknown. And if you move this guy to the other side, then we can write h to be minus h minus 1. Right, the inverse of the Hessian matrix, assuming it exists, right, times that. So here we go. So what we can do now is Taylor's method, uh, in, in Taylor's methods, Newton's method. We start with x zero. X naught, which is our initial guess, and we update the guess called the new guess x1 to be x0 plus h, which h? The h we just derived. So this is going to be equal to x0 minus this big H, capital H of f evaluated x0 times the gradient. And this is the first iteration of the multivariate Newton's method. So, um, if we if we go on and so we can compare, right? If you remember, this is the iteration written for the single variable Newton's method, right? Where you have the first derivative divided by the second derivative, and that's the update to your initial guess. The multivariate version, now these here should be, you know, boldface. We use capitals here instead, but I'll put top to make sure this is understood as vectors. All right, the update will be the same thing. This, this, is th this takes place of the second derivative division, and this takes the per place of the first derivative, right? Here we have the first derivative divided by the second derivative. Here we have the first derivative vector, let's say, divided. That's abuse of of the word, right? We don't divide by a matrix, we compute the inverse of a matrix. So that's that's the, the meaning. So this is almost like the univariate New Newton's method, but updated to include multiple variables. Here's some examples just to drive the point home, right? So here's our old function back again. We start at minus one to one, right? We compute the gradient here, uh, compute the Hessian matrix. Here is the, the gradient evaluated at that location. Here's the Hessian, right? So we update the initial guess using, and here's the inverse of the Hessian, right? So we in, times inverse of the Hessian times the gradient, and that gives us a step, right? And we can we can arrive at the optimal of value of this this function uh, in a much much more. Um, uh, uh, convincing way, right? So uh, much faster, this converges much faster than the gradient descent. And the analytical solution here is is given as here, right? So basically, in, in one step, you can get to, to the true value of the function. But like the Newton's method in one dimension, in multiple dimensions, Newton's method can diverge too. Right. Let's say if we started right here in this position here and we computed, let's say we want to minimize. Well, what Newton's method will do is it will approximate the, a quadratic function around this location, right? The multivariate. And maybe you will land you somewhere here, whereas the true global maximum is over here. So you can see that this method can completely fail. Right. So which is the same uh, take home lesson as the one dimensional Newton's method for minimization. One last note is that sometimes it can be very difficult to evaluate the first derivatives and second or any derivatives of a function, right? So for example, if we have a function, let's say we have a function of f, uh, x and y, and we want to compute, let's say we want to compute df dx evaluated at x, y. But let's say for some reason we have a very complicated formula that is very difficult to, to evaluate this. So we can approximate it. So we use this quickly to be approximated uh, 
by the following idea where you have f of x plus h y minus f of x y divided by h and if we take h to be a small step size this this approximates again df x y dx how do we approximate df dy we just add a small perturbation along the second variable right so how do we do this same thing but along the second variable now f of x y plus h minus f of x y divided by h. So we choose some small value of h and we do these computations and we can approximate these derivatives that way. We can apply this formula once more to compute the second derivatives and so on. And this is often done in practice to avoid some, sometimes you have a very complicated function and it's very uh, laborious to evaluate, very computational expenses to evaluate the gradients and derivatives. So this can be done as well. And just to finalize things, you know, once again, we have been talking about this type of minimization problem or equivalent maximization where there is no requirements there are no restrictions on what values the independent variables can take x and y this is as opposed to constrained minimization problems which are also very useful in fact perhaps more realistic than unconstrained ones oftentimes where you have still the same minimization but now we have a requirement for example that x and y must be such that they must satisfy this equation Right, so essentially B points along a circle, for example. Right, everything that we have said so far applies to unconstrained minimization, and we're not really going to cover constrained minimization ones because it would take much more than a week to, to discuss that. So in MATLAB, as we already discussed, you have uh, the f mean unconstrained function to do this. Also, the f mean search, which is a more generic version of the same function. I encourage you to look at the documentation for that and, and learn how to use it.